OK, well, there has been some hype about hydrogen over the years, people claiming that it's going to be the solution to all our energy problems. Certainly, hydrogen is going to be important in the future. I don't know whether it's going to solve all our energy problems, but it's certainly going to be an important part, for example, on, in motor vehicles for low-carbon emission vehicles, and perhaps a hybrid car with a battery, like a lithium-ion battery or with a hydrogen and a hydrogen fuel cell. These will be a hydrogen cars of the future, zero emissions, nice and quiet. Uh, and also hydrogen can be used to store intermittent renewable electricity. A lot of people complain that the wind's not always blowing when you need it or the sun's not always shining when you need it. So you need to store electricity. And hydrogen is one way of doing that. But one, one thing I would say is that the idea of everything being solved by hydrogen in the future is probably misconceived. There will be important roles to play, but there'll be other technologies that are equally important. I'm an enthusiast, but I, I'm a, every scientist, every engineer is conservative in a sense. They don't want to make too much of what they do for fear of failing. There have been problems with hydrogen about being oversold, and I'm not reacting against that so much as trying to be a realist. I, I am generally concerned for sustainable futures. I want energy to be available for everybody, but in a sustainable way. And I believe that hydrogen has all the kinds of ingredients you need to have to uh, help in future energy. It's, it's readily available. There's lots of it about, albeit tied up in water or biomass. So it's easy to produce in principle. You can store it, although there are technical challenges there. And you can use it in a variety of different devices at the end to produce energy in fuel cells or in combustion engines. So it has all the right kinds of ingredients, but um, there are other technologies that will probably be around to also help us be more sustainable in the future. Uh, yes, I am conservative, but secretly my heart is beating quite fast because I think there are lots of interesting things to be said about hydrogen. There are a number of nuts in hydrogen. It's easy to, and that's reason, part of the reason why I'm quite cautious about how I express myself. First of all, there is a lot of hydrogen in about, but you need to produce it. Um, when I say hydrogen, I mean what's called molecular hydrogen, which is H2, which is the gas that does the business in terms of producing energy in the end. So we can make it from water or biomass. So making it's not always straightforward. And actually using it in the end can often pose difficulties. There is a device called a fuel cell, which is a very economic way of using hydrogen to produce electricity. But there are issues with being sensitive to the purity of the gas, to uh, how long it lasts and how expensive it is. But actually, the right at the heart of this is how you store hydrogen. OK, well, hydrogen is the lightest element in the universe. Uh, and just to give you a feel for the storage problem, let's imagine you need to drive a car, say, 300 miles on an engine powered entirely by hydrogen. You would need probably around about 5 kilograms of hydrogen, which is about a third of the weight, or third of the mass, strictly, that you need for, for gasoline or diesel. However, the volume occupied by this amount of gas at room temperature and pressure where we are now is about 60 cubic meters which is about three times the volume of the car and that really illustrates the fact that hydrogen needs to be squashed into a small space to make it a reasonable prospect on a vehicle or in any kind of application and the real challenge is to get as much hydrogen as you possibly can in a smaller space as you can with the least amount of energy involved in the process and really we're part of that, that, that sort of enterprise. There are, there are established technologies for storing hydrogen. One of them is liquefaction, basically cooling hydrogen down to a few, only a few degrees above absolute zero. The problem there is you need a lot of energy to get it down to those temperatures, and then you need a lot of energy to keep it there. Another way is high-pressure gas, which is storing it under pressures up to 700 bar. And just to give you an idea of 700 bar, that's 350 times the pressure in your car tyre. Those are also uh, regular technologies, but they do have penalties attached, mainly to do with the energy required to get them there and to keep them there. So what we're trying to do is to develop technologies that rather try and raise the temperature above liquid, not liquid hydrogen temperatures and drop the pressure compared to high pressure gas. And we're converging on kinds of conditions that are closer to the conditions we have in, where we are today, what are called ambient conditions. Can, you can have motor vehicles powered by liquid hydrogen, except that you have liquid hydrogen is at temperatures that are around about minus 250 degrees Celsius. These are 
off the scale in terms of human experience. You can't even believe liquid, it's, it's much, much colder than liquid nitrogen temperatures, which you sometimes see on these fancy cooking shows these days. Uh, it's an astronomically low uh, temperature, and it requires a lot of energy to get there and a lot of, lot of energy to stay there. And as I say, the problems of these high pressure or low temperature systems, they're almost beyond our experience in terms of the, these kind of conditions. And what we're trying to do is, uh, is to engineer systems so they don't have to go such these hugely low temperatures and massive high pressures, which means that the systems won't be so expensive, which means that we can maybe operate them in much more, uh, they're, they're much safer, uh, and we don't have to spend so much money engineering the systems to contain the hydrogen. Uh, and as I say, there are, we are an, amongst a number of groups working in an engineering system to try and generate these new storage uh, approaches. Well, Valeska and my other research students and research group, we're working on an area of hydrogen storage where the hydrogen is contained inside a solid. Uh, a, a, a classical example of a solid is something like a carbon, an activated carbon that many people have heard of as a way of purifying water, for example, or you may have in the hood of your cooker. And inside the, these materials, they contain very, very small pores. And these pores are maybe only five or ten atom diameters across, in technical terms, a few nanometers, ten through millionths of a millimeter across, very, very tiny spaces. And it just so happens that these spaces are ideal to pack hydrogen molecules in. And so if we can get the hydrogen molecules contained in these very tiny spaces, we might get more bang for our bucks. And what that means is we get much more hydrogen in this space compared to if we just had it in the lab under the same kinds of conditions. And it's a sort of like a mini compressor. That's the way these things work. And what we're trying to do is to both, we're trying to do two things. Design materials that have the right structure to do this kind of uh, storage. And secondly, really to understand at a molecular level how these things work. And both these work in a sort of cycle. You understand the molecular level, you can work on the material a bit better. Working on the material gives you more information so you can understand what happens at the molecular level. And eventually you'll end up with a good, really good, solid understanding of what's, what's happening and therefore maybe we can design new materials to, to work even better. It almost sounds counterintuitive that if my petrol tank was full of substance I could fit more fuel in it. What's going on that makes you able to store more hydrogen? It's a very interesting topic and I think it's still at the boundaries of our knowledge and understanding of what's going on but this, the, my simple picture is this and this is coming out of recent results that Valeska and my other uh, students and postdocs in my group have been developing. The way that the hydrogen fits into pores, it, first of all it sticks on the pore wall, it sticks on these surfaces inside the material and then starts to sort of pile up. But that piling up is limited by the proximity or the opposite pore wall. And it's rather, rather, rather as if these two walls of the pore sort of force the molecules to pack rather like billiard balls in a, in, a, in, a, in a container. They all tend to pack in the most cost-effective or space-effective way. And it's the action of the way that the molecules pack into these spaces and also the interactions between the solid and, this, and the molecules inside the pore that together mean that you have a, a, a very... It's rather like the pressure inside the pore is much, much higher than the pressure outside as a result of these sort of what are called steric effects, orientation, the molecule packing effects, and the interaction with the pore wall. And it's those two things together that combine to act in a way to suck in like a sponge all the hydrogen and, uh, and get you more bang for your bucks, as, as, as I've just said. How, how effective a sponge is this? I mean, how much hydrogen are you fitting per volume compared to if you just filled up a balloon? This, this is uh, it's, it's a very interesting question. The way that these things are measured are in rather technical quantities, but let me just give you some values. Some of the targets that are set for these materials are set in the United States by the United States Department of Energy, who is a very, very powerful, authoritative uh, group who set appropriate targets for these systems. And that one target is, is, has been in the past around 10 weight percent as a sort of benchmark. What does that mean? It means that for every uh, 10 kilograms of material that contains the hydrogen, one kilogram of that is hydrogen. Now these targets are actually um, 
an advancement of the US DOE target. It's, it's a figure that's often used as a benchmark. A good material has got 10 weight percent, a poor material hasn't. That, that is, a, that is a, it's in, in many senses, in many physical senses, that's a remarkable amount, considering the fact that hydrogen on its own occupies hardly, hardly any space at all. So let's imagine if I wanted to drive a car, again, 300 miles using hydrogen, I'd need around about five kilograms of hydrogen, and roughly if I wanted to use hydrogen entirely to power the vehicle, which would mean, mean I'd need 50 kilograms of um, material to contain it. Now that may not compete necessarily with a tank that contains 80 litres of gasoline, but of course the big kick here, which we haven't talked about, when it's used, there's no CO2 produced in the vehicle. All it produces is water. It's silent. There's no noise on there. Uh, the material is fairly innocuous. It's probably safe to manage and hopefully one day low cost, although these things change with time. And if you make the hydrogen using nice and sustainable technologies, you've got a very low carbon route. If you believe in climate change is link, link, linked to carbon dioxide emissions from burning fossil fuels, then alone these are powerful arguments in favour. And really people like myself and Valeska and our colleagues are looking at a way of making that a reality. It's not there yet, um, but there are companies, Japanese motor companies in particular, who are very excited about motor vehicles um, using hydrogen, using, okay, the technology might be a bit clunky at the moment, but we're understanding things a bit better and I think one day Maybe in the not too distant future, my guess is in five years, we'll start to th see cars on the road um, using hydrogen and then the infrastructure, of, in other words, how you refuel them will start to develop. Why did you, I, I've seen the technology you have downstairs. It's a really nice setup. Why did you need to go to ISIS? This is an interesting question. The, the, the experiments we do, and most of us do in laboratories in, in universities, are limited by the uh, kinds of equipment we can we can use, and most of the scientists like ourselves and engineers uh, measure the amount of hydrogen taking up almost as if by weighing it. It's like we weigh the sample. It's a, it's a very crude way of putting it, but it's not far off. You weigh the, weigh the sample in an environment of hydrogen, uh, but that doesn't tell us just how the hydrogen sticks inside this system. Do you remember I mentioned to you, I think that the hydrogen sort of piles up on the surface. Well, this is me literally waving my hands around. We don't quite know where it is. And so the idea of using neutrons is that neutrons, the way that neutrons are scattered through a material will uh, tell you something a little bit about the state of the hydrogen inside the pores. And no one has ever done an experiment to look using neutrons in a little bit more detail about where and how the hydrogen is contained inside the pores. We sort of make a rather clunky observation that there's a few weight percent of hydrogen there, but you don't know quite where it is. So you need these extra tools and technologies. And neutrons are an ideal way of doing this because the scattering from hydrogen is very well understood. And in fact, as Valeska may have told you, we've had some results in the last few days that, subject to the appropriate checking, and all the kinds of peer review we need to do in science these days, we believe will have a major influence on understanding how hydrogen is taken up by these materials. And, and we're very, very excited about that.